Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming to this event today uh, entitled Unraveling the Arab Spring, Egypt Since 2011. I wanted to note that this, uh, I'm here in my capacity as the director of the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum. I wear a lot of hats at the university and within the International Institute, but I'm, I'm here in that capacity because this panel really was made possible by uh, the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum and the WCED, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies. So DISC and well, the Wiser Center um, really were a perfect match for bringing this event about, um, bringing it into fruition. Uh, and that's because um, what WCED, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, focuses on is the promotion of scholarship to enable us to better understand the conditions and policies that foster transitions from authoritarian to democratic rule, past and present around the globe. And what DISC does, the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum does, is it seeks to um, promote a better understanding of the cultural, cultural history and politics of the Islamic world by offering students at all of the Big Ten universities access to a unique, robust, and continuous set of courses that are dedicated to Islamic studies. So really the two coming together is, is sort of the perfect match for this event. Um, and DISC in particular wanted to do something special this year for our distinguished lecturer. I don't know how many of you got to see uh, Bassem Yusuf last night. Uh, it was a fantastic performance. Yeah, it was, um, that was really uh, our idea this year our, for our distinguished lecture. We thought we'd do something really different. I think that was really different for a distinguished lecturer to be uh, a, a political satirist uh, doing a, a show. And so we're particularly proud of that. And, and I, will, I will welcome our, our honored guest um, um, at the end. Um, I also want to thank, before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I want to thank our other co-sponsors. So WCED and DISC had some really important co-sponsors in the, this event. UMS, the University Musical Society, could not have done this event without um, um, their support. Um, and uh, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, which Samar Ali, I'm going to introduce him in a minute, is our directs. Uh, and Juan Cole, next to him, is the former director. <laughs> uh, and the Islamic Studies Program. Uh, Carla Millet, I don't know if she's in the audience, I don't see her, but she's the director of the Islamic Studies Program. So the Islamic Studies Program, the, uni the University Musical Society, and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies were really core um, co-sponsors in this. Um, our panelists today are really just an elite group of, of very um, knowledgeable people when it comes to the Middle East in general and Egypt in particular. And I'm going to introduce them one by one. So Samar Ali, to my left, and he's going to speak first today, is an associate professor here at the U University of Michigan. Um, he's an associate professor of Arabic language and literature in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. And he's the director, as I mentioned, of Semenis, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies. He is the author of Arabic Literary Salons in the, Middle, in the Islamic Middle Ages. Uh, and he's currently working on a second book about the 10th century poet Al-Mutanibi. I said it wrong, didn't I? Al-Mutanabi. Al-Mutanabi. Better. Uh, his research, this isn't my field, <laughs> um, his, his research examines the intersections of language, scapegoating, and community in the Arabic Islamic Middle Ages. His research has earned uh, seven national and international awards, including five Fulbright Awards. His articles have appeared in numerous journals, including the, Islamic, uh, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Women. And at U of M, he teaches the Arabian Nights, Islamic law, Arab women poets, and peace and nonviolence in Islamic cultures. Juan Cole, to uh, Professor Ali's uh, left, is the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History here at the University of Michigan. He has authored several books that seek to put the relationship of the West and the Muslim world into historical context, including Engaging the Muslim World, Napoleon's Egypt, and many others. His most recent book is The New Arabs, How the Millennial Generation is Changing the Middle East. Came out in July of 2014. Professor Cole is also a prominent public intellectual. He has appeared on PBS's Lear NewsHour, ABC's World, New World News Tonight, Nightline, The Today Show, Charlie Rose, Anderson Cooper 360, Rachel Maddow, uh, Chris Hayes, uh, All In, and the, Col the Colbert Report, um, as well as many others. He has also given numerous uh, radio and press interviews, and he has regular columns at The Nation and Truth Dig. Um, Jean Lachapelle, to Juan's left, <laughs> is a postdoctoral fellow at the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies here at the University of Michigan. His current research examines the causes of state violence and authoritarian regimes, and his first book project theorizes autocrats' decisions to use repression based on in-depth fieldwork in Egypt. More broadly, he is interested in issues of revolution, the relationship between violence and political order, with a regional focus on the Middle East and North Africa. So these are three very knowledgeable person, uh, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable people who can bring to bear much sort of 
intellectual scholarly work on the region uh, in general and on Egypt in particular. We also have, as I mentioned, our esteemed distinguished lecturer, uh, Bassam Youssef, uh, and he, I would argue, has one of the most unique uh, set of credentials that uh, of anyone I've ever met, at least in the academy. Um, that's both because he is a real doctor, as opposed to the rest of us. We're not real doctors, right? <laughs> like my dad said, why don't you go to a real doctor and make some money? Um, and he also has a wicked sense of humor. You know, we in the academy mostly are humorless, but he, he both is a real doctor and he has this wicked sense of humor, as we all were introduced to last night. Uh, and if you've seen his show, um, you know, you know that's, that's for sure. Um, so he is not only a talented uh, uh, surgeon, he is also the creator and host of the first political satire show in the Middle East called Al Bernameg. Uh, this essentially means the show or program, uh, and it started as a five-minute online program on YouTube in 2011, about six weeks after uh, the fall of Mubarak and the Egyptian uh, revolution, the Arab Spring. Um, and it gained uh, prominence uh, very quickly. It spread very quickly like wildflower, wildfire. It became incredibly uh, popular, critically acclaimed, um, both nationally within Egypt and internationally across the world. Um, so famous, in fact, that he ap appeared twice on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Um, Al Bernamek uh, deliberately... <laughs> four times! Oh. <laughs> well, geez, update your bio, why don't you? That's, that's not your biggest claim to fame, I have to say. Okay. Um, John and Oh. Yeah, so. <laughs> 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 Bernamek deliberately and boldly used humor to expose and to criticize the ruling Egyptian regimes of both, um, the both <coughs> ruling Egyptian regimes that came to power after the fall of Mubarak. So both President Morsi and General Sisi. Um, he, he was obviously doing something right, right? He was using political satire correctly, uh, because by 2014, the regimes have had, en had enough, and he was forced to terminate the show um, due to ongoing political and personal threats. Um, so again, we welcome Basim Yusuf here, and we're very delighted that you were able to join us both last night and today. Um, the format of this panel is going to be the following, a little bit different from what you might be used to. So, each of our faculty presenters are going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes. Immediately after they finish their comments, uh, Dr. Yusuf is going to, the real doctor, is going to give about a five minutes, I'm gonna try to ha hold him to five minutes, a uh, commentary on, uh, a critique and commentary um, on their, the, the, the scholars' uh, comments or their presentations. So I, I have to say I feel to very humbled. All of these people are actually real academics, which I'm, I'm not. <laughs> So I, I, I just want to say, like, I'm extremely humbled by the presence. Uh, you guys have, like, published stuff that I would never even dream of. So I'm, I'm actually here to learn, not to comment. So if, uh, well, you, I, I'm you just going to be, like, uh, I, I, yeah, I can discuss. <laughs> I, can, I can say, like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my comment. You're right. You, you, you can feel free to <laughs> punt, to not discuss, but I have a feeling that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so so you, have, you have the option, five minutes to come in or not, but the idea is to sort of stimulate some discussion and sort of um, bring some, some key points uh, out of the scholarly discussion by your ex experience as a practitioner and a, and a political satirist. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then we will open it up to Q&A. Uh, that's why you have those little note cards, those handy-dandy note cards that are in your seats. Those are for you to write down questions or comments of your own. Um, if you have long-winded questions, I'm going to cut them down because we don't have that much time. We're only going to have about a half an hour or less for questions and answers. And then I'm going to allow each of the panelists to, to have a minute or two to kind of uh, make their final remarks. Okay? So that's what we're going to try to accomplish today. I'm going to try, I'm going to hold our panelists to 10, 15 minutes apiece. Does that sound good? You can do that? Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Samar Ali. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jones, um, and um, we're uh, all doctors uh, on this panel now. Yes, we all are. But uh, different, different, <laughs> uh, different senses. Um, I, I really, it's a fantastic honor to be on the stage with you. Uh, you and satellite television have changed the media landscape in the Middle East um, in the last, what, 20, 30 years or something like that. Um, so today's talk is um, uh, sort of to take advantage of the opportunity and to uh, 
to share with you some poetry, some Arabic poetry by a poet named uh, Hafiz Ibrahim. Um, here is a picture of him. Uh, Hafiz Ibrahim was a satirist uh, in around the turn of the century. Around, uh, he was born in uh, the late uh, 1800s and died in the early uh, 1900s. And uh, he faced British colonialism in the same sort of way that uh, satirists today, and Bastam Yusuf in particular, faced uh, dictatorships. And what I'm trying to try to do is draw a parallel between um, the sorts of imperialisms that are going on today and back then in 1906, and, um, and to use poetry as my <coughs> vehicle. And poetry, uh, first and foremost, is really important to me uh, because, um, you can laugh, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it, it's sort of, it's a, for me, it's a way of, of, of reading the writing on the walls. Sometimes things are obvious, uh, but, but we don't see them. Uh, poetry has this way of capturing um, a moment in time, whether it's our time or another time. And so to me, poetry is this amazing way to get insight into uh, deep anxieties and hopes uh, of people a long time ago. And in my case, I work primarily on the 9th and 10th century, so we're talking about more than a millennium um, ago. And, but here today, we're gonna be talking about a moment in 1906. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is um, a, uh, uh, um, it's, it's sort of my simulation of an experience I had. Uh, you see stickers like this all over Egypt, all over Cairo, uh, sometimes in elevators, sometimes in cabs, sometimes in buses. And it basically, it's a saying, you know, from the Quran, say, nothing shall befall us except what God has ordained for us. Um, and in particular, I had this moment where I had seen a, a, a sticker like this on an elevator. And it made me think about patronage. It made me think about power and patronage descending from God down to earth historically. I work on kingship in the ninth and 10th century. So you see sacred kings uh, basically um, claiming to act on the behalf of God and then human beings calling that into question or sometimes playing with it, pushing back against it. So here we have God is the head of a system that ordains what humans, what shall befall humans. And in this particular case, I saw the bumper sticker with graffiti. I saw a sticker with graffiti, and instead of God, what God has ordained for us, somebody had written what America had ordained for us. Um, and it called into question for me the, the, the degree to which Egyptians today, even today, after independence, feel uh, in terms of autonomy over their life, sovereignty over their nation. Um, and, um, and to me, I think a lot of what the Arab Spring was about was pushing back against not just a regime, not just a person. The chants from Tahrir Square began with very specific calls for change, uh, people to go, um, but eventually at its height, uh, the chants from Tahrir Square were clear and quite maximal. The people want the Nizam to fall. What is this Nizam? It's usually translated as regime, but regime in Arabic would mean something like ahd or maybe hukuma, uh, government. Uh, nizam is something else. Rather, nizam here means something more like system. Um, as Basim Yusuf was talking about yesterday, a way of doing things, a structure. But we're not just talking about a local Egyptian structure. We're not just talking about a cabinet and cronies and a mafia that rules Egypt. We're talking about a global structure that works with this mafia that rules, uh, that ruled the country. Um, and many of the people that I spoke to before and after the January 2011 uh, protests, I was in Egypt actually the summer right before the protests, uh, finishing the last Fulbright. And, um, and, and so many people told me that, look, this isn't just frustration with our government, it's frustration with a patronage system where America protects and enables this particular government. So we're talking about global structures and puppet governments, uh, particularly uh, the puppet government of Mubarak. That is, people wanted Western imperialism to fall. Terribly ambitious, but that's, I think, part, in large part, what many, many big thinkers wanted when they saw this movement in Tahrir Square. 
Uh, we're talking about a structure of Western supremacy over non-white peoples of the New World, Asia, Africa, that began to manifest itself with Columbus in 1492 um, and reached its peak um, in the 19th century. Um, and then we're going to come to our moment sort of um, in 1906 where so much of this British sort of imperialism in the Middle East and around the world was coming to its peak frenzy. Here is protest from Tahrir. Uh, this is a dumb little map uh, showing eight European powers and America and the way in which the world was carved up in 1900. Um, uh, something, it's colossal. Uh, a large percentage of the world was colonized by European powers uh, around 1900. Um, <clears throat> What I'm suggesting today is that the Arab Spring was an attempt in part to uh, overthrow, um, to not necessarily overthrow, but to directly influence and coax a global structure, a Nizam, that deterred and prevented third world democracies. And I'll show you some pictures from Tahrir Square that kind of help to make this point. But I need to kind of get to this indirectly by talking about a very, very important poem by Rudyard Kipling uh, that he wrote in 1899, which is basically an anthem to Western supremacy, maybe even white supremacy. Uh, it's called White Man's Burden. That's where we get the phrase white man's burden. And to make Hafez's poetry uh, make sense, I, I need to kind of go through this a little bit to show you some of the cliches and tropes of Western supremacy. Um, he, he wrote the poem, obviously, in the context of British and American imperialism, not just British imperialism, but America had its own expeditions. Uh, in the Philippines and the Spanish-American War. Um, and um, and uh, let me just uh, skip through. Uh, and a lot of what you see in this poem is sort of classic uh, bonding. What's that? Yes. Uh -huh. um, classic sort of bonding of white people uh, against and scapegoating brown people uh, based upon a perceived moral, physical, or associational defect. Those are the three stigmas, types of stigma that we oftentimes find. So uh, the first opening of the poem is, you know, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed to serve the captives need. The captives here are the natives who are captives in two senses. First, they're captives because of their own stupidity and their own enslavement, self-enslavement. And then they become captives when they are freed by the by the white man. And I say white man here just because Rudyard Kipling is saying it. The white man cap, you know, makes them captive a, a second time from their own captivity to captivity to the white man. Um, send forth the best you breed to serve the captive's need, to wait in heavy harness, and so on. And then the, the, the natives or the captives are likened to new caught, sullen people, uh, half devil, half child. And sullen here is a tip of the hat to the supposedly servile, passive nature of the, of the, uh, of the natives. And then devil, uh, of course, a spiritual threat, a child uh, being, um, you know, child being a, um, uh, you know, dependency, sort of a prototypical dependency in every family, uh, dependent on an authority figure, necessitating an, afford an authority figure. This is the sort of antithesis that justifies um, the antithesis between, you know, the white civilized, civilizing uh, powers and those that need to be domesticated and civilized and taught. And it's the same kind of antithesis that, that uh, makes uh, possible, makes rational, makes justifiable, uh, for example, the boarding schools that Native Americans were forced to go uh, into uh, from preschool age onward in order for white teachers to civilize them. And the old phrase, the old saying was, you have to kill the Indian in order to save the man. Um, so the next technology, okay. The next, uh, the next stanza is uh, a little bit more of this. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I just wanna hit some of the highlights that are important for our discussion here. Um, that is that pride and dignity need to be uh, pride and dignity need to be checked. Uh, the, the dignity of the brown man, the black man, is a threat, is an, in, is an inherent threat to the authority of the white man trying to civilize. Uh, how, dare, uh, how dare that disrupt the civilizing process? Uh, pride presumes that there is no need for civiliz civilizing. 
Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there's a selflessness here where the white man must, must, must work for somebody else's profit, uh, work for somebody else's gain. But there's also a double entendre. It can also mean for their own profit and their own gain. So it can work either way. Um, so once insinuated, the white man's burden serves as a check to the threat of terror, sh show of pride, and so on. The next stanza, again, just to keep things moving, the next stanza is probably the most important for us because it comes to Egypt as a prototypical place of bondage uh, based on the story of Exodus. Um, but there's nothing really pro-Semitic about the way that um, Rudyard Kipling is using this here. So this stanza is particularly important in understanding, uh, in understanding Kipling's poem as an anthem of Western imperialism, uh, and again, because of the trope of bondage rooted in the biblical story. Uh, like Moses, who pays a heavy price for his selfless heroism to putatively save Jews from themselves, uh, yet reaps no true reward, here the white man must prepare himself for the ingratitude of the natives, uh, what, Yart, what Kipling calls the blame of those you better, the hate of those you guard, the cry of those you humor, uh, that is the selfless price that the white man must pay for civilizing those that may not even deserve to be civilized. Uh, so this is the ingratitude that's just to be expected. Um, and then at the end of this stanza, the ungrateful pine for the darkness of Egyptian nights um, and, and then, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're getting a bit more here on the, um, the, the Egypt as a place of benighted uh, bondage, prototypically. Uh, okay, let me jump forward. This is the last stanza. Again, in gratitude, grudging praise, prepare yourself. The interesting thing about this last stanza is that it's tied to manhood. Um, so with Hafez Ibrahim, uh, the beginning of his ode, the beginning of his ode uh, echoes uh, the long tradition of Arabic uh, courtly praise poetry. Arabic tradition doesn't have a courtly epic tradition, but there's an epic praise tradition which makes and unmakes power. The making of power is through poetry that's called Madih. The unmaking is through satire that's called uh, Hijab. And so, uh, here we have uh, the opening hemistic formally invokes that kind of cultural memory, uh, which is praise given to countless leaders, um, but you know, uh, oftentimes with, with conditions, uh, terms of what that leadership. Here it's truncated uh, to, um, you know, with invoking, have you forgotten our loyalty and love? The conventional relationship between rulers and ruled, even foreign rulers, uh, who rule over Muslims still uh, has to, it, it gets measured one way or another by the, um, by the uh, conventions and standards of praise poetry which set the terms for what is due to the ruler and what is due to the ruled. Um, the next line begins, this line number two, begins a theme that really runs through the whole poem and it echoes, uh, it sort of dialogues with Rudyard Kipling which is this idea of contained, precise, civilized violence. And how can violence, which is you know, by its nature outward and explosive, uh, be contained? Uh, so here, curb your rage, sleep soundly. How do, how do you reconcile those two different directions? Seek the hunt, roam the country. Um, and then at the end of this, 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 the third line, there's this, this simile, this extended simile between uh, doves and humans who uh, in this incident um, are like sitting ducks. And the incident is, again, not much time to go into it, but, but it's basically just a kerfuffle between British soldiers and, and, and Egyptian peasants where a bunch of Egyptian peasants ended up um, uh, being hanged uh, and 28 were, were sentenced to hard labor and flogging and so on. It was a fiasco for the British and a trauma for the Egyptian people. Um, and this is you know, the, the, the incident that he's responding to as this supposedly contained civilized violence that you know, how can you possibly reconcile the two? Um, let me jump forward. Uh,
let me jump forward more here. Uh, um, here we have this invocation of the Inquisition and Nehru, again, two unpleasant uh, pieces of historical memory from European civilization being reflected back onto the British. Um, again, questioning the idea, is this kind of contained, surgical, precise violence ever possible? Uh, how can you claim to have humanity? How can you claim to be civilized? Uh, here in this line, bless us with our land, which you occupy, verily the virtuous reward the virtuous. So the golden rule of reciprocity, but again, you know, bless us with our land. How is that possible? These are the conundrums that are posed by uh, occupation, uh, British occupation and imperialism. Um, okay, so let me go, just go back here. Um, the Nile mother refuses to hate. These are, this is the ending of the anti-imperial uh, section, which is the first half of the poem. And, and it's really a statement of, of nonviolence and absolute refusal to go down that road uh, because of so many consequences. But the Nile mother refuses to hate those who hurt it. She abhors being hated. So there's that reciprocity of once you go down the road of violence, you open yourself up to the exchange. Um, but then in the exchange, she has not but language to her name, an allusion to uh, writing uh, being uh, sort of a part of Egypt's history, one of the first uh, cradles of civilization to produce written language. And then again, after tears, she gifts only tears. Um, so what we have here is, is sort of a, a critique of the British, in particular, in the way that they responded to this incident, but a pushback on the very idea of white supremacy or Western supremacy, uh, pushing back against the system of Westernism that regulates and polices uh, uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal nations, abnormal states. What we find in Tahrir, uh, and these are photos I got off of the internet, I wasn't actually there, uh, was References that echo, that echo the 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 sort of that speak to the United States, that speak to that structure, that um, that is the contemporary Western imperial structure, uh, led mostly by the United States. Here, KFC is there are actually two KFCs if I if I remember correctly, right off of Tahrir Square, and so regardless of where you are in Tahrir Square, which is massive, you're going to be close to a KFC. Um, and, and so here the Tahrir says, uh, the, the, the sign says, uh, new from Kentucky, uh, that's what people call KFC, uh, go, the just go combo. So it's like, like Mubarak, just go, just go, just go. So it's the just go combo, new from uh, KFC. Uh, again, speaking to an American audience with at least some visuals, if not the language in particular. Uh, here we have next to AUC some graffiti on the wall, antique di dictator for sale. Uh, again, AUC is sort of uh, thought of as an outpost of American interests or American institutions. Um, and then this, which is probably the most striking, um, which uh, is it plays off of the Shepherd Fairy foretone uh, with that Helvetica font. And, and you know, you're getting that, that uh, dialogue um, re trying to resonate with American um, audiences who might be able to influence this uh, system of imperialism. That's it. Thank you so much. Oh, and this is a Gandhi quote that I like. <laughs> Well, uh, since we're uh, having a, a great uh, political satirist, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's response per. I'm sorry. I thought it was a film. Uh, I'm I'm getting the hang of this too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so should I stand or should I stay? Or okay, okay. Um, uh, all right. I'll just stand there like everyone else. Um, so. Uh, um, so um, I, I heard a lot of about like uh, Western supremacy and white supremacy and uh, Western imperialism, and uh, this is kind of um, 
the same narrative that we'd hear from um, many of the Arab and Islamic leaders in the Arab world. It's like it's always nice to have an enemy to blame them for everything. Uh, yes, uh, Western civilization has its downfalls and has its kind of mistakes, but also we, as, uh, we also had our own Islamic colonization history and Islamic, uh, um, you know, uh, imperialism movement. Uh, we we it's kind of like it's it's always nice for um, um, in 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 countries like the Arab wars and the Islamic wars to speak uh, volumes about like how, how the West is destroying us and controlling us, but they. Um, uh, deliberately forget that what we did in Northeast Asia and what we did uh, uh, in other um, civilization in order to spread uh, our uh, Islamic civilization through, you know, invasion like anyone else. It, this was like kind of like how, uh, how things rolled at that time. And it's a way to um, divert attention to uh, uh, bigger powers, to blame them for our uh, uh, problems the whole time. Uh, this is why uh, it's um, when you said uh, about like Lanyu Subhanahu Allah Makatub Allah only only whatever befallen us will be ordained by God. All of this idea of like a, a greater power that we have nothing we get to do uh, against to change whether this was God or America, and and this is kind of a way to stop peop people from thinking or rethinking the status quo. Uh, everything is going to be the same whether because this is the will of God or because this is the will of. Uh, uh, greater powers conspiring against us. And this has been used a lot by um, uh, regimes in the Arab and the Islamic world. And it doesn't matter if you're a military regime or you are an Islamic regime. It doesn't matter. They're using the same exact thing. And I said that today, ha being a military regime doesn't mean that you're secular. It's just like meaning that you're non-Islamic on the surface, but you're pretty much conservative and you use religion like anyone else. And um, I remember like the first few days of uh, the revolution, the people who were like front and center of um, resisting the revolution were the Islamic Salafi leaders who were basically created by the state. Uh, there was a kind of um, um, some sort of an operation where if you, uh, if you were against what's happening there, you're allowed to go to Alexandria because there was a big Salafi movement there where you were go there and you go into your like little conservative bubble and everything outside of this bubble is are considered like anti-God, anti-Islam, uh, uh, and a kind of an infidel word. And uh, so, and this was like a brilliant move by the regime because for them, um, the election is haram, democracy is haram. So we're just like, gonna be in our own bubble. So when the revolution happened, they said like, no, revolution is haram. Everything has to be stay the same as the status quo. And when the uh, the elections were allowed, and they, they saw that they have a chance to actually to go, suddenly elections were halal, and uh, we can do it. Um, so it is, uh, the, the whole idea of, of, of having um, an enemy, a scaring, a, a scaring enemy like uh, the West or the uh, uh, America or the white supremacist, uh, it's just like a way to divert the attention from uh, the shortcomings of the, of uh, the government or the rulers itself. Um, and uh, you find it very interesting in Pakistan how uh, Pakistan is one of the biggest receiver of American military aid and they burn American flags almost weekly uh, in the streets and they have a very strong narrative of, um, of anti-American uh, uh, narrative in, uh, in their mosques every Friday prayer. So it is just like it's, it's uh, what, what I take it is just like how you would bring uh, um, kind of uh, use the enemies of destruction. I joked yesterday about like when America needed enemies, uh, you know, we were there, uh, you know, uh, serving that purpose. And it is very uh, interesting to see that how the Arab world has been using this for decades. It's always America or Israel. And, uh, and in the same time, secretly they are in bed with them, receive them having like uh, security arrangements, uh, receiving aid, uh, uh, exchanging military experience. So it is just a way to uh, divert attention and uh, have people uh, content of what they have already. So that's it. Yeah. I don't know if I added anything useful. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I want to start by uh, telling you my uh, Basim Yusuf joke. I uh, spent some time interviewing youth uh, revolutionaries in uh, Tahrir Square uh, in uh, uh, 2011 through 2014. And um, 
uh, a lot of them are bloggers, and uh, uh, these are just some pictures that I took uh, at the time of the protests. But uh, I, one young man was a particularly eloquent uh, blogger and um, uh, had very interesting ideas. And so I contacted him. I said, uh, could, could we meet? Could I interview you? And uh, so he said, sure. Uh, and so it, 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 he invited me to a pizzeria in Zamalek, which is kind of the European island uh, there in the middle of the Nile, uh, and uh, where the Italian embassy and so forth were. And uh, apparently a lot of the youth hung out at this pizzeria. And so we got to talking, and I interviewed him about his life, and we were very serious, and you know, he had used to be a, 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 a Muslim fundamentalist, a Salafi, but now he had become very secular. And uh, we went on, and I said, well, you know, I'm writing a book. Can I quote you? He said, dude, I'm a blogger. Uh, so yes, of course you can quote whatever I say. And then it got to be about 8.30 in the evening. This was a Friday night. And he got very antsy. We had such a deep conversation, and I was eager to hear more from him. But it was very clear from his body language that he needed to be someplace else. So I said, what's going on? He said, dude, we're going to miss El Bernamig. We're going <laughs> to miss pass some use of show if we go on like this. So, uh, you know, the revolution, revolution. We, we had to make time to, to see the show. Um, so these youth, um, uh, these youth had very interesting ideas. Some of them, I think, were, were quite innovative. Uh, one of the groups that I interviewed uh, had this idea of, of personal freedom. And what they meant by that partly was bodily freedom. So some of them were gay, uh, but it wasn't just that. It was like young men in, in Egypt, if they go out you know, into the street, especially in the evening, uh, they get patted down by the police. Uh, they get harassed by the police. Basically, all Egyptians are treated by their police the way minorities are treated in New York. Uh, and. Um, uh, so they wanted to protest this. They wanted to protest their bodily integrity, how they, they ought to have control of their, own, of their own bodies in public space. It shouldn't be at the disposal of the police. And of course, people were arrested uh, for minor infractions, and the police were always looking for uh, pot or, or, or drugs. And uh, very famously, um, Khaled Saeed uh, was uh, beaten to death by the police, uh, having been uh, arrested on a... a Possibly a phony drug uh, charge in an internet cafe, uh, and and you know there are many stories about Khalid Saeed, uh, who was a uh, a young man in Alexandria, had a little bit of a Western education, and we don't really know why the police targeted him for this brutal murder. Uh, some people say, well, he was he had some video of them doing police brutality, and they wanted to suppress it. That didn't work out for them, uh, but. Um, uh, others say that it was it was just business as usual. So th you know, torture, police harassment, all of these things. These young people wanted to stand against, um, and uh, and and so they developed this philosophy of personal freedom, uh, not not Lockean freedom. You know, our Western American idea of personal liberties is really very property based. Uh, it's, it's, you can't. You can't have somebody arrested for hurting your feelings. Uh, and apparently, it was all right to be groped, uh, uh, in, at least until very recently, by powerful men. Uh, but uh, but if, if somebody had like shoplifted $5, you know, that's jail time. Uh, that, that, that's an attack on property. Well, these young people, it seemed to me, uh, were developing a different idea of personal liberty, which had to do with identity, uh, uh, bodily integrity, and the comportment of a person in public uh, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, characterized by liberty uh, was one of the things that they were after. Um, uh, other of their ideas, uh, I, I don't mean to critique them too badly because, you know, some of my friends are still in jail or, or basically on parole. Uh, people that I interviewed at that time, but um, they uh, they had a bit of an anarchist point of view on things often, uh, and I remember I met with them in Tahrir Square, uh, and uh, in 2011, the summer of 2011, they did a, a, another big round of protests, and I met with some of the uh, April 6 youth group, and I said, you know, 
elections are coming up this fall. As one of their demands was to have free and fair elections because the 2010 elections had been phony and everybody knew it. Uh, and um, uh, so I said, uh, are, are you walking the streets? Are you contacting people? Do you have voter lists? Are you supporting a particular political party? And they looked at me funny. They said, no, isn't that something a political party would do? We're a youth organization. We make demonstrations. They were planning out more demonstrations. And I heard this guy on the, on, on, they had five big stages at Tahrir Square. Some of the people were reading poetry. Some of them were reading political speeches. One guy was giving a seminar on Montesquieu and the, the separation of powers, uh, why the military shouldn't be allowed to, to take people to military courts because it, the military is part of the executive, so they shouldn't be allowed to have judicial uh, powers. Uh, so Montesquieu, you know, finally had arrived in Cairo. Uh, and, but one of, these, uh, uh, one of these speakers was, was pessimistic. He said, look, you know, we've been very good at making demonstrations. We got the president to resign. But if we go on like this and we have nothing to offer people but demonstrations over and over again, after a while, people won't want to hear the word Tahrir. After a while, we won't be able to get anybody out for demonstrations. We have to have something more, a positive political program. And that guy's call fell on deaf ears. And so these youth that I was talking to seemed to think they could just keep the demonstrations going forever. And it would be a way of pressuring the government on particular issues. So it was kind of like a, uh, a, a standing public committee of censure for, for the government. And people theorized this. So there were members of parliament who were elected in the fall of 2011 uh, who, who actually said, you know, we understand the youth will be watching us. And if we uh, fall into corruption or into authoritarianism of the old Mubarak sort, we expect them that they would come out and demonstrate. So the, the youth were, were, were kind of positioning themselves as this standing censure committee. And in Tunisia as well, people spoke like this. They said, well, you know, we, we don't, we're not too worried about the new government going in a wrong direction because we know the youth will, will come out if they do. And it reminded me of Thomas Jefferson, because Jefferson, you know, thought there should be a revolution fairly frequently. You shouldn't just have one and it's over with. Otherwise, he thought then you get, you know, kind of a permanent bureaucracy and an authoritarian tendency will develop in the federal government. Uh, so I, I'm quite sure that if Jeff, someone actually put forward Jefferson's idea seriously today that he thought maybe every 25 years you should have a revolution, uh, that the FBI would want to have a conversation with that person. Uh, but these youth, I think, had that kind of idea of an uh, ongoing uh, revolution. Uh, and uh, it ran into inertia and, you know, when, when you have a, 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 a demonstration in Tahrir Square, uh, it closes down commerce and the big government buildings were nearby. The government work doesn't get done. And uh, people, after a while, get tired, you know, of not being able to make any money or not being able to get business done as usual in the government. Uh, so um, uh, the... the uh, the youth started running into some inertia over time. And then, of course, one of the big things that happened was in both Tunisia and in Egypt, um, um, Muslim fundamentalist parties came to power at the ballot box in the aftermath of the overthrow of the dictators. And while they had a power base and they were popular in certain quarters, the real reason they won those elections was not that everybody loved them, but they were very good at running elections and getting people out and doing the kinds of things that the youth told me they would never do. Uh, so they, they, they were outmaneuvered by the fundamentalists and many of the youth were left of center. Some of them, you know, were basically communists. Uh, and, um, but the, it was the fundamentalists who, who did better at the ballot box. And that threw a scare into everybody because, you know, in the United States, the stereotype of the Middle East is full of fanatical Muslims. Well, it is full of Muslims, but there are all kinds, and not everybody is a fundamentalist, just as not all, you know, not all, everybody in the American South is an evangelical. Uh, and uh, I think that we have to push back against that stereotype because there are Trotskyites, and there, there are all kinds of people um, among the Arab populations. And um, 
a lot of people in Egypt and Tunisia are relatively secular-minded people, or nationalist-minded, I should say, not secular. And then they might go to mosque. And it was not political for them, or they don't want politics to be made on the, on the basis of religion. So uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power in Egypt, they, they actually uh, put in a law that um, uh, if the e Egyptian government wanted to take an international loan, well, loan interest is forbidden in Islam, that it should go to the Al-Azhar Seminary to be looked at, this deal, whether it's allowed or not. So they were starting to put actual power in the hands of clerics. And one of the chants against the Muslim Brotherhood wa was uh, there were two members of, of the party uh, uh, in parliament, uh, uh, one named Katatni and one uh, Ariane. Ariane was kind of the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood Youth Wing. So the people would, would, sh would chant, even in villages uh, away from the cities, they would chant, Katatni wa Ariyan Musarlan Takun Iran. Egypt will never become Iran. So this is a way of pushing back against the sense that the place is becoming a theocracy. So then people made a, a revolution against, uh, against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and it was maybe impelled to some extent behind the scenes by the army, uh, which didn't like those people. And uh, on the other hand, it seemed to be pretty widespread and pretty popular on its own right. And it was also... Uh, um, co-opted by the army. Of course, now you have a military dictatorship. So I'll let Jean tell us about uh, why they decide or not decide ab about deploying the military. But one thing I would say is that in Tunisia, the military wasn't deployed against the, uh, the youth in the streets because uh, the, the dictator, Ben Ali, had coup-proofed the military. He had come to power in a military coup, a soft military coup. 1987 himself, he had been a general, and so he didn't want that to happen to him. And so he cut the army down to size. So the Tunisian army was only 30,000 men. Well, it's not like Tunisia was planning to fight any wars or anything, but we had 200,000 people on the streets of Tunis, the capital, in January of 2011. Uh, it's not clear that the army could take them if you only had 30,000 of them. And then there's some danger, uh, the, some of the army depots started being raided by the youth. It started to turn into a violent revolution. And so the army just didn't want that kind of trouble. So they, they, they basically told the president, we're not going to shoot the Tunisian people for you. And if your chief of staff tells you this and you're a hated dictator, you might as well have them start the helicopter running right there. Uh, so Ben Ali had to flee. Likewise, in Egypt, I remember the, the chief of staff came on television and said, we're not going to interfere. We're not going to shoot the Egyptian people for this regime. We're with the people. And this is not entirely true, because they did shoot a few of them. But uh, on the whole, and by and large, the army tried to uh, stay out of it, uh, unlike the secret police, which were with, with the dictator. Um, and this is partly because uh, in Egypt, uh, the, the majority of the troops were conscripts. And conscripts are not politically reliable. They were in, in, in high school with the, re, with the demonstrators last year. You know, they're now being brought into the army. So you give them an order to shoot their old classmates, they might not obey it. And as a, in a military dictatorship, you never, ever want to give the army an order that you're not sure they will obey. So the more, you know, uh, the, the demography of the Egyptian army, uh, 300,000 conscripts, um, I think played a role in its not being uh, deployed as well. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the, the, the youth couldn't keep the demonstrations going. They became unpopular. The, the Muslim fundamentalists seemed to be making hay with all of these new rights. Uh, and people in Egypt, at least, acquiesced in a, in a very brutal military coup, which killed thousands and which uh, is still with us, and then gradually started rounding up the, the youth leaders. In Tunisia, you had a better outcome, uh, but still there are elements of the old regime that have asserted themselves. So this turns out to so far be an adventure and not uh, a huge change in uh, the way things are done. But as uh, Bassem Yusuf said uh, last night, uh, it's not over till it's over. And remember, uh, Václav Havel was arrested by the Soviets in 1968, running a pirate radio station uh, for a humanist uh, Marxism. And then he was never allowed to uh, produce his plays and made to work in a beer factory the rest of his life. 
But by the early 90s, he's president of the country. So we're very early in this process. Thank you. Um, a couple of ideas here about like um, how the um, Islamists were more organized. Yes, that's true. Um, I remember when uh, uh, after a while when there was like demonstration after demonstration and people were getting fed up and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood were smarter because like uh, I was speaking to them and they said like, oh, it's, it's no time for demonstration now. It's like the revolution is over, we need to build. And, and as a matter of fact, this kind of um, won them a, a few points with the army, the army and the Muslim Brotherhood at the beginning, the, the first year of the revolution, they were kind of like in their honeymoon. They were uh, pretty much cooperating together. And um, the Muslim Brotherhood media made sure to uh, vilify every uh, kind of uh, revolutionary act. They would even, uh, if so, if the uh, if the um, uh, I the youth would call for some sort of a strike, uh, they would uh, launch uh, a campaign called uh, "Take me uh, instead of him," like or like "Hire me instead of him." We will find you ple ple if if you find a problem with the. Uh, hiring people because of the strike, we are go ready to step in. And uh, and this was just like one example, and the examples like can go on and on and on and on. But when, when they were overthrown by the uh, army, suddenly they're revolutionary again, and they were like calling for like, you know, for uh, anarchist acts. And you, you find, uh, what's interesting is you find like how the Muslim Brotherhood reacted differently towards a dictator like Sisi, how he was of course, you know, uh, rightly so vilified and uh, called the devil and a dictator like Erdogan in Turkey and how he's like on because he's on my side so he's a good guy and uh, th that kind of hypocrisy is very interesting to see how people can like change their opinions and uh, uh, situations according to their own interest um, the um, uh, the thing about the army um, how the army in Egypt uh, did it intervene uh, in, the, in the first couple of days, the first actually day, uh, I still remember uh, the sight of a two military armored vehicles being burned down to the ground because they tried to intervene in the beginning and when they saw that it's what kind of like too much, they pulled back. So the army in Egypt wasn't angelic from the get-go. They, they thought that they have a chance to, uh, to put it out and then I think somebody said like, hey, maybe this is a chance to get rid of Hosni Mubarak and his civilian son. Gamal Mubarak, and it's just like, it seems that they just made the best out of it. The army was uh, portrayed as a savior, uh, and uh, suddenly we would have tanks uh, coming out of their um, uh, army camps with Yaskut uh, Hosni Mubarak down with Hosni Mubarak, which is like, hmm, he's still your supreme leader, right? So it's kind of like as if they were kind of trying to, to, to stay as a kind of an equidistance from everybody. And they kind of use this as the best they can. So um, it's politics. That's it. <laughs> OK. Um, can, uh, can everyone hear me? This microphone's a bit low. Um, it You're is too tall. <laughs> <laughs> too tall. It's my, it's my fault. Um, it's quite an honor to be sitting at the same table as Basim. Uh, I remember watching his show on television in Cairo, and I would have never imagined in my wildest dreams to be sitting next to him on a panel. Uh, so this is both exciting and uh, a little bit humbling for me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some peculiar features of Egyptian politics since 2013 uh, that trigger my interest, both as a political scientist and as uh, someone who spent time in Egypt in recent years. In particular, I'd like to address some of the prominent narratives that one hears about the current regime led, led by President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, uh, which tend to point toward a similar conclusion. Uh, which is that this regime is fragile, that the current situation is unsustainable, and that we should wis witness the unraveling of this regime anytime soon. Uh, the point I am going to make in this talk is that these arguments tend to exaggerate the fragility of this regime, uh, and they prevent us for, from thinking clearly about what kind of political order is emerging. Uh, to briefly anticipate my own argument, I'll be saying that the central thing that these narratives miss is that how the perceived threat of the Muslim Brotherhood 
uh, plays a role in keeping this, this weird coalition together, uh, that this regime. Uh, this is the point that I'll get uh, to in my talk, but first let me uh, get through these conventional narratives. Um, one first narrative that one often hears is that the current rulers are just incapable of governing uh, and that therefore they won't last much longer. Uh, since 2013, uh, the regime has faced a number of very embarrassing moments. Uh, for instance, when the military made the improbable announcement that it had discovered a cure for AIDS, for instance, that Bassem talked about yesterday in his, uh, pres in his uh, show. Uh, and according to many observers, this, the legitimacy of the regime would be undermined once, once these hopes would be exposed. Uh, the second narrative concerns the widespread, indiscriminate, and seemingly unproductive repression uh, that has targeted large segments of the population. Uh, security forces have killed and imprisoned thousands of people. They have clamped down on NGOs, and there have been reports of uh, 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 several disappearances. Uh, this repression seems so out of proportion and arbitrary that one often thinks that it must backfire. Uh, there's a third narrative that concerns economic mismanagement. Uh, the government has embarked on costly infrastructure projects that have uncertain payoffs. Uh, for instance, the broadening of the Suez Canal, which also Bassin men mentioned yesterday. Uh, as, as the government fails to deliver on its promises of economic betterment through these projects, one often hears that there will inevitably be demand for change. And the fourth, uh, the fourth and last narrative, and this is perhaps for political scientists, the one that is most striking, concerns the absence of any party organization that could mitigate tensions among elites. Uh, what I am conveniently calling the CC regime in this talk uh, is in fact a shorthand for a very loose coalition of actors that include remnants of the Mubarak regime, people who, pro in addition to people who protested against Mubarak and who, who now support Sisi, in addition to different state agencies that c have competed for all their existence and have different interests but now seem to be working together. Uh, and all these different groups coalesce around the figure of President Assisi without, without any formal organization, uh, a party that could counter centrifugal forces. And this stability in the absence of organization is surprising, uh, especially given a long tradition in political science that sees parties as essential organizations for sustaining author authoritarian rule. Um, Indeed, parties in political science are seen as crucial for the survival of autocrats because they do several convenient things. Uh, they clarify who gets what within the regime. They facilitate the distribution of patronage. They make internal deals among elites more transparent and, th and thus easier to honor. They mitigate power struggles. They facilitate the peaceful transfer of power. And they create long-term horizons for supporting the regime. And somewhat ironically, Egypt is among the countries that have played an important role for political scientists uh, who sought to understand how these authoritarian parties work. So there's famous work by uh, political scientists uh, called Lisa Blades and Jason Bronley uh, who have studied the National Democratic Party, uh, Hezb al uh, which was the ruling party under uh, Mubarak. And their books portray the NDP, the National Democratic Party, as a central reason why the regime that fell in 2011 proved so durable before it lasted for several decades. Uh, so the implication in political science is that the Sisi regime without a party is vulnerable, or at least is much more vulnerable than the Mubarak regime ever was. And yet it is still standing, and it appears that Sisi is on his way to being reelected next year at the risk of making a prediction that could be wrong. Um, so what are these narratives missing? Uh, they miss an important source of regime stability since 2013, which is the shared perception among some important actors that the Muslim Brotherhood poses an existential threat uh, to Egypt. And I would argue that, that this perception has two effects. First, it makes elite uh, coalesce, and it also creates a divided opposition. Um, first, at uh, the elite level, the fear of the Brotherhood generates some temporary cohesion that makes elites very adverse to change and very afraid of instability. Uh, so they, they are concerned about what could come after Sisi, and they have created ingenious ways uh, uh, without a political party of punishing dissenters and those who leave this coalition. So there's extreme intolerance uh, for dissenting voices. 
um, former CC supporters who become critics are immediately accused of treason or ostracized. And over time, the regime has ejected some of the most hesitant supporters, but has kept the most loyal elements at the helm of powerful institutions. So I'll just grab a sip of water. Second, um, the fear of the Brotherhood creates a divided opposition. Uh, before the Muslim Brotherhood came to power uh, around 2011, 2012, the relationship between Islamists and non-Islamists was not exactly friendly, uh, but it allowed for some cooperation on issues of shared interest. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about the, op the activists, opposition, opposition activists. So they were able to cooperate when their interests coincided, for instance, when it came, when they wanted to protest against the state of emergency, uh, which affected all, all opposition forces equally. But after 2013, there was such deep enmity between the two groups uh, that any form of collaboration became impossible. And it became, it has become extremely hard for the opposition to create a broad, uh, a broad front. Uh, so even when the government announced uh, um, that it would hand over two islands to Saudi Arabia, for instance, which was a hugely controversial decision. The opposition organized several courageous protests, protests around the country, but these, they never became regime threatening. So it's very hard to organize. Uh, what do we gain by paying closer attention to uh, these opposition dynamics uh, and to the fear that the Muslim Brotherhood generates? Uh, in conclusion, I would like to suggest that it gives us a useful framework for asking and answering uh, some new questions about, about Egypt. So one question that, that's really important in this context is how lasting are these threat, threat perceptions? How long can this fear of the Muslim Brotherhood be sustained and how long before it recedes? Once it recedes, will the regime feel compelled to create a party in order to institutionalize I its rule? Uh, these are important questions that uh, can be re very re revealing of the current uh, trajectory. And as a final note, uh, I would say that paying attention to the perceived threat of the Muslim Brotherhood also helps us identify some informative parallels that help us think about Egypt's future. So one's impulse might be to look at other countries of the Middle East and North Africa or in Egypt's own past to find parallels. Uh, but I would argue that there are also lessons to be learned from other world regions uh, where regimes that look a lot like the Sisi regime were founded upon a similar reaction to movements that were perceived as highly threatening. Uh, so some examples include the Suharto regime in Indonesia in the 1960s or, or the Pinochet regime uh, in Chile in the 1970s. And of course, closer to Egypt, there's also Algeria, which also experienced a coup uh, to stop the, the takeover by Islamists of, of state institutions. So interestingly, all these regimes looked Relatively, relatively similar to Egypt in their early years, but they went along very different paths. Uh, some established a ruling party, like, like in, in Indonesia, but others did not, and the outcomes were very different. Um, so so to, to, to end this talk, I would say that the main question for understanding Egypt's future is whether the threat of the Brotherhood can be sustained over time and institutionalized. Uh, thank you. The, um, you are right, I kind of like, I think this is a, um, on paper this regime should not uh, exist or continue, but they are actually, uh, uh, they are staying in power and they are, uh, the, the more brutality they exhibit, it doesn't matter anymore. But also there's also the uh, uh, factors of, there's some international factors that came into play. So I think this regime um, has kind of like became a sellout they just like look to every international powers like what can we do? What, what, what can we do for you to support us? So uh, Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries, I mean they're giving them islands, they're taking so much money from them. Saudi Arabia is willing to pour as much money so not to have a, a revolution in Egypt. Uh, Israel, which is the, the sworn enemy for Egypt, has become the best friend as a matter of fact. Uh, if you follow the um, trajectory of how the voting in Congress and Senate, Israel has been one of the biggest supporters lobbying for Egypt, which is unusual and ne never heard of uh, that. And then there is Europe. 
the bigger, uh, biggest disappointment here. Uh, we, all, we always relied on Europe when America didn't step in. You know, always say like, all right, maybe Germany, maybe France, you know. France, equality, whatever. And uh, this was like the, by far the most disappointing thing. But like as you actually read history, that's not really new for France. France has always been douchebags when it comes to <laughs> uh, dictators. Uh, I mean, when Sadat came to power, they were very vocal again uh, about like how, uh, how much of a dictator is Sadat until Sadat went there and he bought the Phantom Five. It's jet fighters. And then uh, same thing with Mubarak. And then he went there and bought the Mirage 2000, which is another jet fighter. And then uh, with Sisi, Sisi just like poured in like about $8 billion with uh, useless Mistral carriers and um, Rafale, which is the most expensive jet fighters in the world, totally useless. And uh, suddenly uh, France is not vocal anymore. And just like two weeks ago, uh, Sisi was there in France visiting next to Macron, uh, the French boy, uh, sexy boy in France, and he's... Uh, and then they told they were they asked him straight on. I mean, like, they, you are standing next to a guy whose whose country is having a lot of human rights violations. Like, oh, uh, we cannot uh, lecture Egypt of what they can do. It's like seriously, I mean, you're lecturing until you get paid by for your weapons, which is extremely uh, disheartening. Same with Merkel in the, in the, in Germany. Uh, the 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 German the German giant Siemens was single handedly. Uh, saved by uh, e Egyptian deals to get um, turbines, which is like no, mo no, uh, not bought anymore anywhere in the world, and we saved them by nine billion dollars deal. Uh, this is all from you know basically the the CC regime is buying uh, buying out its legitimacy, just like they're straight out bribing Western uh, governments who talk day and night about human rights, which is uh, pretty much hypocritical. Uh, we have uh, a saying in Egypt called a big nitagidni, which means like, uh, yeah, pay and you'll fi you'll get what you want. And uh, and also there is this idea of uh, the the refugee scare. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think six months ago, uh, Sisi had um, an interview with an Italian newspaper, and they they kept asking him over and over again about human rights violation. And I said, like, and he, he had just uh, this way of diverting the conversation. Well, uh, uh, this is not the time to talk about human rights violation. We need stability. Or else, do you want a hundred million refugee at your doorsteps? So basically, he's using Egyptians as a kind of a ransom, as a kind of a, uh, explosive belt. It's like, if you touch me, here you go, hundred million uh, people refugee. And Merkel just like did. Uh, uh, they signed a deal with him to con to give Egypt money to control the refugees, which is um, it just it's funny to see how the world of today is is uh, is operating and about like how certain countries and uh, administration talk big game when it comes to human rights, but in reality they don't really care about that. So uh, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're now going to open up uh, the discussion to the audience, uh, and if you could pass your note cards, if you've written questions on them, to the aisle, someone will come around and pick them up and then bring them forward. <coughs> wave them up in the air or pass them to the aisle. If you're, if you're not close enough to an aisle, you can wave them up in the air. We'll try to, try to get to as many as we can and let the panelists, um, we'll maybe group some of them and, and let them respond. French government. Thank you. So this is a question about LGBT issues. Um, under, and I'm going to try to read the writing as best I can. Under CC, Egypt has become one of the worst places in the world for LGTB. Um, do you ever see that changing? Uh, is it uh, is it going to improve? Um, so I, th I think that's that's one question. Is there is there another one? Yeah. 
Let's just try to ask a few and then have those that feel um, compelled to answer the questions go ahead and, and choose them. Um, Cole touched on the organizing uh, on the organizing of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and secular activists post-revolution. Considering another part of Egypt's population, how can we understand the place uh, or marginalization of the Coptic laity through the relationships between the Coptic clergy and the Egyptian regimes? That's true. We really didn't talk about uh, minorities in Egypt, the Coptic Christians. Uh, other questions? Let's just get a few. Uh, Rachel. <coughs> Also in regard to Dr. Cole's uh, contrast of political direction and revolutionary change, to what extent must revolutionaries support specific policies and leaders? Would doing so affect the viability of the revolution? Nice question and really beautiful writing, I have to say. <laughs> I could read that so well. Um, I think this is for Bassem. Uh, will you come back to Egypt if there is a different president in the next elections? Mm, that's for you. I'm not thinking it's for the other panelists. Uh, another. <laughs> no, it's for us too. <laughs> Is it for you too? <laughs> uh, also for Dr. Yusuf, um, do you have relatives in the Middle East, and if so, are you worried or concerned about the risk repercussions of your activities uh, here upon them back in Egypt? Uh, and finally, uh, also for uh, Dr. Yusuf, um, you became a household name. Have you tried to carry on? With your show over social media, people who believed in you, it believed in your show, felt betrayed after um, you caved to pressure and stopped the show. Okay, I think that's a, a nice array of questions. Um, maybe we can have. Would you like? Would any of you I like I to start? I would I you like I to start? I, I can. I can take all of them in one thing. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, so LGBT and Copts, actually, this is going to be, actually uh, be uh, very uh, relative to each other. Uh, no, uh, they're not going to change anytime soon as long as you have uh, a regime who would uh, use, uh, uh, who would want to pose themselves as uh, the, uh, uh, the custodians of religion and, uh, uh, and the custodians of um, um, uh, morality. Uh, and it's not, it's not the first time. There have been crackdowns of LGBT communities under the Mubarak regime. Uh, 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 LGBT uh, uh, issues is one issue where it is very difficult to defend in Egypt, and this is like a way that you. Uh, uh, this is uh, you. If you want to like um, discredit someone, you're gonna either call him a traitor, a Jew, or gay. This is the uh, three most uh, undefendable uh, accusations in the Middle East, especially in Egypt, and. Um, uh, the, the the last crackdown of LGBT. This is just like a bunch of people raising the rainbow flag. There's absolutely no threat, but hey, that's a good distraction, uh, and it's a way to kind of like uh, cut it short, uh, like kind of like uh, um, prevent the Muslim Brotherhood from using that of like, oh, look at look at this a godless uh, government who allow gay people to exist. So um, LGBT people will always be the scapegoat. They will always be. Um, uh, the the uh, the people who are victims for oppressions because they they are always the weakest link, uh, and this is something. If it's going to change, it it needs to have uh, a ge a, m a, at least a generation or two of uh, critical and free thinking without the interference of an oppressive regime. Uh, I mean, America has had its share of uh, oppression of LGBT under a secular government, and yet until the 1970s, there were like uh, gay people being killed in the streets of San Francisco. So mm -hmm. it, this takes time, and it takes a lot of effort, and it doesn't just gonna happen overnight. Uh, Copts, uh, yes, uh, this is like another minority group. Uh, in 1960s and 70s, the Coptic Church um, turned from a spiritual re uh, leadership into a political leadership, which is a way for the government to kind of like assign the Coptic group to kind of uh, 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 get everybody in check. And, um, um, and and if you remember, there was a big massacre uh, of uh, Coptic uh, uh, protesters in front of the television uh, building. And uh, they, uh, these were kind of secular Copts who did not want to be associated with the Coptic church, but they actually wanted to go and ask for uh, regular human rights, uh, freedom of expression, and, and, and it was a very peaceful, demonstration and they were massacred by the 
the tanks of the Egyptian army, and yet you will have find the leaders of the Coptic uh, churches like, no, 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 these were not tanks of the Egyptian army. We saw that on TV. It's like, no, these were the Muslim Brotherhood dressed at the Egyptian army, which is like crazy. So uh, uh, again, th th this will always be a way to, uh, you know, this is like part of like how mi the military work. Uh, the military work uh, want everybody wearing the same uniform, thinking the same things. They don't want any diversity, any changes, any trouble. And anybody who will be different, whether he is gay, whether he is copt, whether he is secular, whether he is an atheist, those people would be have to be eliminated because we don't want any disruption of the fabric of society. Uh, relatives in the Middle East and come back to Egypt. Well, I, I, I kind of like I'm not thinking right now of coming back to Egypt. I'm thinking more of uh, of achieving my career right now. So when that happens, I will have to rethink what, what, what kind of Egypt are we having. So uh, relatives in the Middle East, I do have relatives in Egypt. And uh, yes, they have been affected by what I said on, on social media. So I have to be uh, mindful of that. Last thing, um, the fact that like many people who uh, felt that I were betrayed because I caved under pressure. I mean, I think I have actually done my share of, uh, of fighting. Uh, I have someone, I'm someone who has been uh, displaced from my country. I couldn't go back and bury my father when he died. Uh, people who said that whoever who said that I was uh, they felt betrayed. How about me feeling betrayed? Like uh, nobody stood for me when like my show was like you know it was taken off the air. I mean how long how longer can you fight with no absolutely no support from anybody? At the end of the day, I'm a human being, and there there is a limit for my endurance and a limit for my resistance. Uh, if I would have caved, I would have taken any of these very lucrative offers to go back in Egypt and do uh, an empty comedy show just to show there is democracy in Egypt, but I didn't. That is co that's called caving. But escaping, so not to be uh, is, uh, imprisoned, I don't think that's caving. That's called common sense. And, um, and the thing is, I, and what, what, I, uh, what I get interested about these comments is like those people who sit on the comfort on their couches and asking other people to fight their fights. Uh, without them doing any real thing, there are more than they can do. They do a couple of tweets. Um, so I, I, I don't think that whoever uh, is betrayed is in position to feel betrayed because I think I have, uh, uh, I, g I, g I got affected much more than they were and I didn't see them coming up for my defense. Thank you. So if it's okay with the other panelists, I, I have about um, eight or ten other note cards that I've kind of summarized into three core questions that I think each of you uh, will be able to shed light on, and we'll go home, and it's okay with the audience. We're just going to summarize them all so that you can get most of your questions addressed, but I can't ask them all as individual questions. So the three sort of core questions that come out of this stack of um, note cards is, first, um, was the outcome of the revolution in Egypt inevitable? Was it preordained? And if not, was there anything different? What were the turning points? So what were the inflection points? How could it have gone differently? Um, two, uh, will there ever be a peaceful transition uh, in the Middle East, a peaceful transition to democracy in the Middle East? Uh, and if so, what will it take? So I think it's a, it's a version of the first one, but um, more broadly asked. And then third and finally, also related, uh, and mostly related to Dr. Uh, Samar Ali's uh, presentation, um, what do you see as um, the the remnants of uh, Western control over the Middle East in general and Egypt in particular? Um, and are there remnants of um, imperialism, neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism that um, do prevent uh, peaceful transition of power in the Middle East today? Jean, do you want to start? Should I start? Yeah, the first question. So was the... Um, um, the failure of the Egyptian rev revolution inevitable. Um, I would say that it was not inevitable. Uh, there were some, some strong conditions that militated against uh, success. Um, the powerful role of the military, for instance. Also, the imbalance among different uh, political forces during the transition. So the, the, um, the domination of the Muslim Brotherhood in the electoral arena, that didn't help. And then there are some more um, um, proximate causes that might be might have been averted. Uh, so if uh, it turns out that in the second run, uh, the second turn of the presidential election, we had the remnant from the old regime against 
a, uh, a guy from the Muslim Brotherhood who was uh, from the traditional branch, that didn't help at all. And um, so if there had been a different, if the outcome in the presidential election had been different, there would, there's chances I would say would have been greater. So there was, there's a critical junction, uh, there's a critical junction there. Uh, I'm, I see it as a, as, a, as a very difficult path to undertake and where every mistake can be fatal. And unfortunately, mistakes were made. Yeah. Is this on? No. Should be. OK, it's on. So um, the question about uh, political transition uh, is um, something that political scientists have written a lot about. Uh, why do some countries uh, transition fairly uh, smoothly to a more democratic uh, uh, situation. Uh, unfortunately for the political scientists, uh, some of the transitions that they touted, like Spain or Taiwan, sometimes didn't turn out you know, that democratic after a while, uh, or uh, Russia. Uh, and, uh, but, but why, why does, d does this transition take place uh, successfully is, is one of their big questions. And, one of uh, Adam Przorski at New York University uh, has crunched the numbers on a number of these transitions over the past half decade, ha half century, and he found a very high correlation between successful democratic transitions from authoritarian regimes and per capita income, which was kind of surprising. Uh, it doesn't seem to correlate very well with things like literacy, because you know India has regular elections, but uh, 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 very poor and and, uh, uh, and and educational challenges are there. I think it's 68 percent literate. But um, if you take all of the transitions together, it seems the ones that have the biggest chance of success are the places which are better off. Uh, so uh, the Czech Republic uh, um, and so forth ha have done better. So if you look at the, uh, at the attempted revolutions in the Middle East, the one country eh, has done all right you know, with the transition towards more democracy is Tunisia, highest per capita income in the Arab world, uh, aside from the oil countries. The, it's the, the, the normal economy that has the highest per capita income. That is to say they have industry, they have services. It's not just oil. And you know, dividing the oil income by the number of people that gives you the per capita income of a place like Saudi Arabia, that's a, a myth anyway because a lot of people are poor and then the princes have billions. So, but, but Tunisia is the one place that has tended, you know, more or less succeeded uh, and it is having regular elections. The political scientists say the, the test for a successful transition is uh, two elections in a row uh, where people agree on the rules of the, of the system and the losers go home. Uh, this sounds very simple, but actually it's very hard to achieve in these situations. So in Libya, for instance, I think they have three parliaments because the losers kept refusing to go home after the election. That's not going to end well. Um, but in Tunisia, They've done it uh, so far. Uh, by that basic definition, they've had a successful transition. Uh, and uh, so uh, Egypt, you know, uh, aside from the very bad choices that they had in 2012 between the most hard line of the Muslim Brotherhood and somebody who said that the old regime, Mubarak, was like a father to him. I mean, if you were running for president in a country that just had a revolution against Mubarak, you know, you might feel that way, but was it necessary to say it? Uh, so, you know, it, it polarized the country. But in addition to that, you have very large numbers of Egyptians living on 2 and $3 a day. Uh, politics are not maybe the most thi forward thing in their minds. And uh, you had a very strong urban-rural divide in Egypt. So in, uh, like, the voting on the Constitution, Cairo, Alexander rejected it. Rural, rural populations, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, Constitution, uh, in, in 2013, it was uh, it was rural versus urban Egypt. So th the 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 poverty and the things that come along with poverty, like uh, uh, challenges in, in in literacy and organization and so forth, that uh, uh, was a very difficult uh, obstacle to overcome. It, it it can be overcome in some instances because they're only talking about percentage chances of success. 
but uh, the percentage chances were low. Yeah. <coughs> uh, let me jump in with the remnants question about uh, remnants of imperialism. Um, there, there are definitely remnants of imperialism. The big difference between uh, Hafez Ibrahim's time and now is that imperialism back then was um, was nation state based and outward toward the world, um, uh, like British or French colonialism or imperialism. Um, what we have now is is less of that nation state based imperialism and more that the nation state is heavily influenced by corporate influence. In the United States, uh, a, a lot of a lot of foreign policy does not necessarily jive with American national interest as for just from a nationalist perspective um, it, it, it either it, it either expresses or you know um, channels and influence of corporations uh, their need for investors and sales and so on uh, or it's sort of influenced by lobbies lobbies of special interests uh, in Washington um, and the way that shows up in particular in Egypt is um, well, you know, with um, the, the, pr the, pr the prevalence of, um, of American corporate inf interests, particularly, um, you know, it, it's no coincidence that, you know, KFC is invoked in one of the pictures that I, that, I, that I showed. It's, you know, a prominent American institution. Kentucky is a name of one of the states. Um, and, you know, it's made fun of as an American uh, symbol. Uh, Adel Imam has a really funny, uh, you know, line poking fun at uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, but anyway, these sorts of things are, are you know, corporate interests uh, that are in that you find in in fast food, you find in um, you know uh, other other sort of uh, uh, branchings out, military contractors, military sales of uh, weapons, and so on. Um, and those corporate interests, I think, are are driving much of the imperialism rather than uh, geostrategic national interests of a state like the United States or Britain or France. Bassem, did you want to comment on any of those three questions? No, no, I, mean no? I, I okay. already talked a lot at the beginning. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Uh, okay, I have one more question which is directed uh, to uh, Bassem Youssef, asking you whether you saw the Egyptian film Crash and what you thought of it. Yes, uh, actually it was directed by uh, a friend of mine, Mohamed Yeb, uh, is, uh, and I, I had the, the honor to be the in the premiere of, its, uh, uh, of, of this film in Carthage Film Festival in Tunisia. And Maybe we should say a little bit what the film's about. Oh, so the film is, is about like, um, how do you call it? Um, there's not like a, a similar one here uh, where you are you guys? Do you are you guys with? Uh, do you guys watch the new HBO movie, The Deuce, about the prostitution? You know, like how there was like a, a police car that kind of like get all the prostitutes. Yeah. Do you have it here? Do you still have it here? Because I I never seen it here. Yeah. Yeah. We we're, we're we're still anyway. So, uh, yeah, the a police fa van where you bring people pr people uh, kind of collect them from the street in order to uh, take them to uh, prison or. So this is th this is this was like a, a very brilliant movie where the whole movie is shot in this van, the whole ninety minutes of the movie in this van, and uh, it's just like people are randomly picked up from the streets, and you have people who are secular, people who are Muslim Brotherhood, people who are pro army, and they have like a very um, an incredible interaction, and I think I, I mean it, this is a very good movie to watch. I I really liked it. So yeah, so I saw it. So what's the question? <laughs> What did you think of it? Obviously, you oh. liked it. <laughs> Just it's great. <laughs> 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 yes. Any other follow We have no questions left from the audience. OK. Well, then I'm going to turn it over to the panelists and see if they have any final remarks that they'd like to make. Anything that was left unsaid that you'd like to say? <laughs> we, talk, we talk about Trump every single day. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well with that, I think we'll thank all of you for coming thank and you. thank our guests.